guys come down here month in and month out to work hard to make sure that you're entertained. Can we give them a round of applause, please? All right, now down to Hall of Fame. You know, it takes a lot of things to uh, be inducted into the MWA Hall of Fame. Uh, for me, it's not just being a, 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 a wrestler, ring announcer, or whatever it is. I think that 99.9% .9 of the people that are inducted into the MWA Hall of Fame are a class act. This class of 2011 is second to none. A lot of the people that are in this class are very special to me in many, many ways, and very special to some of these other guys. So what I'd like to do is, is tell you a small story about the first guy that we're inducting into the MWA Hall of Fame. 1996, I purchased the MWA from the fabulous Danny Fargo in Nicholasville, Kentucky. I'll never forget the day. Uh, we drove down, and I called up north because I've been wrestling for years, uh, four or five nights a week, and I saw this guy in the ring, and he wore a tuxedo every time we were together, and he portrayed himself well. The fans loved him, and uh, I told myself, I said, when I bought the company, there was three people that I wanted to hire. The first guy was Roger Ruffin because he has the best mind of anybody I know in wrestling. The second guy at that time was a referee by the name of Harvey Hamilton. Great referee. And uh, the third person that I told myself that I wanted to uh, be a part of my company because he's not only the greatest ring announcer in the history of my company, the MWA and your company, He's a single dad that does it every day, that, uh, that takes care of his kid regardless, has no help, but he goes to bat with that little kid every day. And uh, he's out here, and if you look at the monitor, ladies and gentlemen, the class of 2011 welcomes Slick Rick Tom. And remember, we used to do the MWA hotline together. 
He called me up. I'd be in Ohio. He'd be in Kentucky. He'd be on the same phone line telling everybody to make MWA your Sunday night habit. But I did want to talk about these guys who get into the ring and give your blood, your sweat, and your tears. I mean, sometimes I give my sweat because I'm always wearing this stupid jacket. It gets pretty hot. <laughs> but I so respect what you guys do. I mean, I love professional wrestling, and I'm honored that you guys are all right out here at ringside. And uh, I guess at this point, very, very honored. I'm happy to share this with all of the folks sitting here. And I want to say this. 41 years the MWA's been around. Yeah. And I would like to assume it will be around 41 more. So what that means to me is after I'm gone, I know that I will always be remembered right here in the MWA, and I think that's pretty special. Thank you very much. Hey, I did need to ask you a favor. I need to ask you a favor. Just wait. Uh, I know you're here. You're a Hall of Famer, and you didn't plan on you were going to get your kid, go back to the hotel, whatever. I think you're the greatest ring announcer in, in the history of the NWA. All these people, some of them never even heard you ring announce. Would you ring announce the main event here tonight for us at the Fanny Bush Elementary School? any more favorites of you tonight. <laughs> this next guy that we're inducted into the MWA Hall of Fame is, I can't even explain how many times I wrestled him. I can't explain how many times he kicked my head off. I can't explain how many times we had fun together. I can't explain the athlete that this guy is inside this ring. I know that everybody hears that you know what, that stuff's fake. You guys didn't hit each other. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. If you want to believe that, you believe that. This guy, I can tell you, one night in Georgetown, Kentucky, he kicked me with a super kick, kicked me under the eye. I had a mouse under my eye before I landed. But that was the only time the guy ever really hurt me. But I can tell you this, he's like a ballerina inside the ring. I mean, he's a walking ballerina, and he's probably, and I love all you guys, he is by far the best wrestler I have ever competed against in my lifetime. I've wrestled for the WWE, I've wrestled for WCW, I've wrestled for all of them. This guy, without a shadow of a doubt, is the best wrestler that's the most, uh, I mean, he's the most sought after superstar in the world, but I can tell you this, he's probably the one guy that has the best wrestling ability that never got a chance. And I promise you that, and I'm sincere when I say that. My brother and I talk about him, Jim Chadwick knows about him, Tuffy knows about him, everybody, I don't know if anybody ever got the, the privilege of seeing this young man wrestle. But ladies and gentlemen, it was with my honor and my privilege that I would like to induct this man into the MWA Hall of Fame. He's known as the headliner, Mr. Chris Michaels.
Chris, I was out here putting you over and putting you over, and I'm not going to put you over anymore. I think you're great, and it's a, uh, it's my pleasure to induct you into the 2011 NWA Hall of Fame. But now that I'm here and I see the response and see all you people, see all the guys out here, I'm telling you, it's been a long time since I've been nervous and I am really nervous right now. You know, I can go on and on and talk about all my accomplishments and everything, but being inducted into this Hall of Fame, it's got to be at the top of that list. And I want to thank everybody for thinking that much of me to induct me in the MWA Hall of Fame. I'll try to make this brief. 22 years ago, this year, I started my wrestling career. I had just turned 16 years old. I was still a junior in high school. A uh, local promoter, uh, his daughter went to high school with me, started a little wrestling school there, and I thought, man, what are the odds of a pro wrestling school coming to this little small town? I'm like, this is a sign. Because I grew up, my mom, as a pastime, took me to watch local wrestling events when I was a kid, and I, and I told her one day, I guess I was five or six years old, and I said, Mom, take me and let me be on that, on that TV where those guys are. And... Uh, and here I am, a skinny little kid. I probably weighed 140 pounds, but uh, I was very lucky. A lot of guys have it really hard, really rough training to be a pro wrestler, but I have to admit, uh, I had it pretty easy because uh, I guess they thought they saw talent in me and thought I could go somewhere, and they, I guess they thought they could, uh, you know, live off of me, you know? But uh, out of 22 years, yeah, I want to say I never got the brass ring, I never got that big contract, but I have been privileged to call pro wrestling my career, my living for the past 42 years, and to me, just being able to step through those ropes and perform in front of you people, that's making it. That's making it. Ain't just how much money you got in the bank, how many titles you want. It's getting to do what you want to do in your lifetime. You know, that there's so many people that say, well, I wish I would have done this when I was younger, and I had the chance to do this when I was younger, and I just never done it. But me, even though I don't have the fancy house on the hill or the fancy car and, and money in my back pocket, I'll admit I came here broke today. But you know what? I'm still happy because I get to do what I want to do with my life. I started my career with the MWA with, uh, I know you know the old promoter, Dale Mann. I started with him the latter part of uh, 1989 and then went into 91 when I graduated high school. I went on the road with him full time and at that time, summertime, he had all the fairs. Man, I was busy six, seven days a week and I was, I thought, man, I've made it already. But uh, I broke away from Dale Man. I got the opportunity to go to the USWA. I had a tag team partner by the name of Todd Morton. And uh, we became the USWA Tag Team Champions on two occasions. That's a big highlight for me. And uh, we got to work with a famous tag team you may have heard of, PG-13. Had an ongoing feud. And then from there, I got the privilege to wrestle for Smoky Mountain Wrestling with Jim Cornette. 
and I can remember, and I just watched this match uh, not long ago. I got the team with uh, Rock and Roll Express, Robert Gibson, full of Smoky Mountain Tag Team titles. And that was a big highlight for me. And then from there, uh, also uh, rewind back in 1994, I got to do several matches from WCW. And I can say I stepped through the ropes and locked horns with, he was called Stunning Steve Austin then, but you know him as Stone Cold. I got to lock horns with that guy. I got to lock horns with Booker T. Van Vader. And the list goes on with WCW, and then I went on to Music City Wrestling in the latter part of the 90s, on into the 2000s uh, for Burt Prentice. And uh, come 2000, uh, Jim Cornette called me up, and he said, I got a spot open for you and your old partner, uh, Sean Casey, at OVW Wrestling, Ohio Valley Wrestling out of Louisville. And what we were paid to do there was, as we had... They had a TV, we had TV matches with guys who were on contract with the WWE at the time. And they weren't big stars then, they were just learning their craft too. But our job was to have matches with them on TV and then take them out back and critique them. Tell them what we thought they'd done right, what they'd done wrong, and what they could work on. And some of those names are, you can't see me, John Cena. Batista, uh, Shelton Benjamin, Randy Orton, and now he's in the UFC at that time was Brock Lesnar. I got the privilege to work with those guys before they, they became uh, huge and famous and make tons of money. By the way, you guys are welcome. I did in 02, I got a brief stint with TNA. And another guy by the name of Rick Michaels, we're no relation. Uh, we got the tag team against, I know you're probably familiar with this guy wrestling this area forever, uh, Wildcat Chris Harris. And the Cowboy James Storm. We worked with those guys, uh, TNA, uh, briefly. And then, for some unknown reason, I was relieved of my duties. But since then, and then I was just thinking the other day, speaking of Hall of Fames, I've gotten the privilege to step in the ring with, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's six or seven Hall of Famers now. Uh, some of those is great to have a Valentine. God rest his soul, Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning. And speaking of Randy Orton, I got the pleasure of wrestling his dad, Bob Orton Jr. Uh, Dory Funk Jr. Terry Funk. And you know, everybody has a dream of doing, doing one thing or another. Uh, the last Hall of Famer I got to lock horns with was my childhood idol, Jerry the King Lawler. And you know, still to this day, I'm still active, I'm still competitive, but I've been talking with my beautiful fiance back there, Ashley. Uh, we have a little one on the way, and uh, it's 22 years. I can say I've been, I've lived my dream. I have done all I have set out to do. Like even some of the famous arenas around. The only arena I never got to wrestle in that I wanted to, of course, would be for anybody that's around this ring would be Madison Square Garden. But I got to wrestle in some of the famous arenas that I watched growing up, and I've gotten to do what I wanted to do. But I just want to say, if I've had my last match, that I can walk out of this ring tonight and feel fulfilled that I have lived my dream and I've done what I wanted to do. And you know, some of you people, you don't see the, uh, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, what these guys go through, what I've gone through as far as 
you're on the road, you're 100 miles from home, and you got personal problems going on, your kid is sick, and, or the yard needs mowed, and you're 100 miles away, and nothing you can do about it, you're stuck in a hotel. I mean, I could go on and on about the, the, the bad things that, that, that we all go through and suffer and endure. And it's not just wrestling, it's life in general. We all have problems. But the only thing we can do and thank God each day for all our blessings. Thank Him each day for what we do have. And be happy that we are alive and we're still breathing. And that we have all our friends and family around us. You see so much wrestling nowadays. You can probably turn on the television and watch it night after night after night, and it's, you seem like it's shoved out your throat, and it's like, God, oh, wrestling's on again? But I mean, you people are here live, and you get to see it live. There ain't nothing like seeing it live. And I know these guys right here, to get in this ring, it, it comes from the heart, and they're very passionate about it. It's what they do. It's their life. That's what they live for is, is to do is get in this ring and perform in front of you. And you have no idea, no idea of the risk of injury that it takes. One little small move and a guy can leave here paralyzed for life. So I just want you guys to keep that in the back of your mind. When, you know, and you say, oh, that guy done this, that guy done that. Just appreciate what he's in here doing. Because there's so many people that sit in the back and say, ah, the, he does this, he does, I can do that. No, you can't. No, you can't. Professional wrestlers are a small breed of people, really. Now, there's a lot of guys that get in this ring, but there's only so many that can call themselves pro wrestlers. And I'm proud to say that each and every one of these guys are pro wrestlers. But I can't say it enough. I want to say thank you for having me here. And thank you for thinking as much as me to put me in the NWA Hall of Fame. God bless. And I hope to see you down the road very soon. This is the last guy. We got our two guys, Rick Thomas, Chris Michaels in the ring. This guy holds a special place in the MWA. I think he holds a special place with a lot of guys that are standing around the ringside. I don't have a large monologue. I just shoot from the hip, but I tell you what comes from my heart. And that's sometimes when I start crying and all that other stuff. I think when I had kids, I got real emotional. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about this guy. First, you know what, and I'm shooting straight from the hip. This guy's class act from start to finish. He's a class act from the time he puts his shoes on in the morning until the time he goes to bed and covers up at nighttime. This guy's a class act. The very first time that I ever knew about uh, this gentleman was I was running a show in Georgetown, Kentucky at this big yellow building, and I thought I was running Madison Square Garden. I had a big head, and boy, we were running, we were running rampant. We were the only show in town with the only guys in town, didn't have any business running, and nobody else had any business running wrestling shows. But this one guy gave a lot of guys opportunity. He went to his back pocket, pulled out money, and went to a little town called Mount Sterling, Kentucky, and made wrestling hot in Mount Sterling, Kentucky. So you know what? There was this uh, part of me, you know everybody has a small ego. I'm down in Georgetown, and they're like, Dag on, these guys are drawing 250 people on Saturday nights down there, and I'm on Sunday nights paying $300 rent, got all these superstars. I thought, we're drawing 100 people, and they're blowing us out of the water every Saturday night. They're killing us with guys like Ray the Bear Seal, guys like the Bean Lean Donnie Green, like Shane Parker. All these hungry kids were down in Mount Sterling 
They were doing it. They were selling the place out every Saturday night. And you know what? There's nothing that made me more of a humble human being to know that this guy, I don't know how much wrestling knowledge he had, but he went down there because he loved his two boys, Shane Parker and Tom Booty Parker. And they went down there on Saturday nights at the Hensel Street Jubilee and they made professional wrestling on I-64 Corridor right down at the Hensel Street Jubilee, believe you me. There was a lot of people that tried to run wrestling down there. I even tried it and I looked out there and had 33 people. Tom Parker ran it because he could run for the governor of uh, Mount Sterling and would win. He had 200 every Saturday night. And I, I, I was humble, absolutely humble. But I can tell you this, there's not a part of me that's ashamed to say that there was a guy that's a class act like him that came in there and kicked my hind in on Saturday nights in Mount Sterling when I was in Georgetown, Kentucky, because he's a class act. And I have the utmost, utmost respect for Mr. Tom Parker. And ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome the class of 2011, Mr. Colonel Tom Parker. Thank you, and I appreciate it. That's all I got to say, Chris. 